Thank you, Sumit. I'll be taking you over a series of cases showing some of the uh, mimics of intraocular tumors. Well, this is how I always begin my series of uh, mimics of intraocular tumors. This is your routine OPD where everything looks similar, in the middle of which would be hidden something that may be sinister. And that could be a tumor or a malignant tumor. So we have to go behind the mask and see what is real. Like, i am show you 10 situations where there could be similarities in clinical manifestations or something that is hidden. So if you have a patient with, say, if you're a glaucoma specialist and you have a patient with periocular pigmentation and epistleral pigmentation, is there a possibility of this patient having an intraocular tumor? What do you expect? Suppose you look at the soft palate and you find that there is pigmentation here. You see that? And if you lift his hair and you find hairline pigmentation, what do you expect? This is melanocytosis of the soft palate which indicates that the patient may have esophageal melanocytosis and if there is hairline pigmentation then that could harbinger meningeal melanocytosis both of which could result in mel melanoma of the respective areas. Apart from that when you look at the fundus if you find asymmetrical fundus pigmentation that's choroidal melanocytosis or UL melanocytosis that will also involve the iris and the ciliary body it may look as severe as this. So these patients should be followed very carefully with ultrasound B scan and if at all you find that the area of pigmentation is increasing in thickness with some amount of echolucency, then the patient may be developing an early melanoma. So serial B scan monitoring for thickness is important as well as gonioscopy because these patients have a tendency to develop peripheral iris melanoma, ciliary body melanoma like this patient. This melanoma was never detected until it grew this big because it was hidden in the ciliary body and only when it broke through the iris peripheral iris and the angle and became visible in the anterior segment was this detected on ubm so it's a good idea to do a 360 degree ubm whenever you have a patient with uh, nevasophota and follow it up at least and on an annual basis with a serial ubm and also b scan finally this patient needed enucleation because you know that this patient has a diffuse melanoma all over and the ciliary body melanoma as well and that's the scleral melanocytosis in the posterior aspect. Then we have a sentinel vessel like this and a cataract. You will not be able to see the fundus readily. So you should actually suspect in a patient who has a sentinel vessel, one single or couple of vessels in a particular set of clock hours, then you should suspect that the patient may have a ciliary body melanoma or a ciliary body lesion. It could even be a benign lesion of the ciliary body such as lyomyoma that will also have a sentinel vessel. So unless you do an imaging, you will not be able to differentiate one from the other. So that kind of a sentinel vessel will always harbinger a ciliary body tumor and sometimes it may be evident when the patient looks in the extreme direction with the slit lamp angulated in a totally opposite direction peep through the dilated pupil you may be able to see the apex of the lesion but more often than not you will need a ubm to detect it now if when there is sectoral shallow anterior chamber or a hump like this shallow anterior chamber would mean uniformly shallow but whenever you find a couple of humps like that in the periphery then you're looking at something which is pushing the iris from the periphery and that could be a cyst. So unless you do imaging again, you will miss this cyst. And you will not know whether it's a cyst or a solid lesion. And the solid lesion could be a melanoma. So you are mandated to perform UBM in every patient who has a peripheral iris hum because you will never know whether it's a melanoma or a cyst. Now here is a unique situation by one of my recent patients who had a iris pigment epithelial cyst. If you thought, okay, it looks clinically like an iris pigment epithelial cyst, and send the patient away, we would have definitely done harm to the patient because underlying which was a melanoma. You can see a melanoma with a cyst. So that's a double mask, right? And when you do, of course, plaque brachytherapy, melt size of the melanoma has reduced and continued to regress and the cyst also started disappearing. So you should never 
be satisfied with your slit lamp evaluation and always do imaging in a patient with iris pigment epithelial cyst wherever the cyst may be next set of situations would be unilateral glaucoma in the young this 30 year old has had a trabeculectomy already for uncontrolled intraocular pressure and behind that peripheral iridotomy you can see something brown now his trab has failed he continues to have elevated intraocular pressure he has correctopia and ectropia in a way that is the glaucoma specialists are diagnosed with the case of ic syndrome and he has nvi which is very um, atypical for ic syndrome so whenever a patient has correctopia ectropia in a way and neovascularization of the eyes you should suspect melanoma and this patient indeed had melanoma you, you can see following enucleation you find that that's the scleral flap under the scleral flap there is melanoma bleb also has melanoma so it's become extraocular now because of this inadvertent trabeculectomy now some patients may have a ring melanoma of the iris and trabecular mesh work and that can also present like glaucoma in a young individual but what if a patient young individual has unilateral glaucoma but the pupil is nice round and central and there is no neovascularization of the iris then it's most likely to be a benign tumor such as melanocytoma melanocytoma is laden with pigment and it shed start shedding pigment which gets deposited in the anterior chamber like that and then that can cause melanoma cytoma lytic glaucoma or uh, trabecular mesh work plugged with this pigment causing mechanical obstruction of the trabecular mesh work in granulomatous uveitis you have a couple of situations tapioca melanoma is a malignant tumor which looks like granulomatous uveitis it may look like this on imaging and metastasis can also look like granulomatous uveitis this patient had lung malignancy bronchogenic carcinoma with iris metastasis which may look like large iris nodules which may look like granulomatous uveitis in hypopion there are many situations if hypopion in a elderly individual or a child then you should suspect that there could be an atypical situation especially in a 70 or 80 year old patient who has history of alternating constipation and diarrhea who presents with multiple iris nodules and a yellowish hypopion you should suspect that there could be adenocarcinoma of the colon whenever a tumor metastasizes into the eye it will follow its primary characteristics adenocarcinoma being a secretory tumor predominantly it will continue to have this kind of a secretory quality those are the metastatic nodules in the iris and the patient has consequently yellowish hypopion this was a 60 year old male with white eye hypopion there is no ciliary congestion or circumcorine congestion yet the patient has significant amount of hypopion irrespective of the fact that the patient has a fibrin membrane on the anterior lens capsule which is slightly atypical for this situation there are no synechia at all there is no circumcorneal congestion you should definitely suspect that the patient may have lymphoma leukemia it could be any lymphoma any leukemia all cml and aml predominate of course any type of leukemia can present with white eye hypopion whereas in a child 5 year old child under treatment by a uva specialist for about 3 weeks already with topical steroids has a white hypopion with a level and the uva specialist has not found a intraocular tumor why do you think that has happened with a 7 or 8 mm pupil in a 5 year old child would you be able to see the fundus well of course you will be able to see the fundus well but not the periphery because you have supposed to do a indented peripheral retinal evaluation which may not be possible in a clinic so this child being 5 year old has a peripheral retinal tumor retinoblastoma and that can easily be missed unless you do a 360 degree indented peripheral retinal evaluation and this is retinoblastoma these are all situations where there is anterior chamber seeding of retinoblastoma which may look like inflammation whereas when there is a heaped up hypopion with translucent tra granules then you may suspect medullary epithelioma that's how it presents in fact about two thirds of medullary epitheliomas can get missed clinically they may be diagnosed as glaucoma and cataract and be treated with those um, intraocular surgeries for cataract and glaucoma and they may be missed totally by clinical evaluation in hyphema if a, if you have a child with recurrent hyphema with the iris architecture obscured by a yellowish lesion and that picture was taken in the middle of two episodes of hyphema then you should suspect juvenile xanthogranuloma of course clinical confirmation is when you look at these skin lesions which are quite typical and when you have a hyphema patient with hyphema with a peripheral pigmented iris lesion then that could be a melanoma of the iris which is necrotic causing hyphema and this is a 14 year old child with history of trauma while playing at school and then she has hyphema which has lasted for almost 30 days now 
she has been on oral steroids tranexamic acid with no relief there are levels of hyphema old hyphema new hyphema she was referred to a glaucoma specialist for hyphema drainage and trabeculectomy he did a ubm and he found that iris was thickened at a particular area particular set of claw covers so iris thickening should not be there in traumatic hyphema so we went ahead and did a peripheral blood smear and bone marrow biopsy both of which were negative that's because the child was already on a good dose of steroids and any patient who's on steroids would have um, the peripheral blood smear rid of abnormal circulating leukocytes and that's why this was missed the peripheral blood smear and bone marrow were normal and iris biopsy confirmed the diagnosis in this patient that the child has aml and following treatment the child did well this is a 5 year old child who has had a history of trauma and as an evidence of trauma she even has a small lid laceration you can you can't deny that the child has had trauma and there's a full chamber hyphema they did a b scan and then they declared that it is vitreous hemorrhage because the cross vector is not passing through the area of interest that's a area of calcification so consequently the child underwent hyphema drainage and 7 months later child comes with extraocular extension of retinoblastoma with intracranial extension and regional lymph node metastasis so whenever you have a child with hyphema you should pay very careful attention to b scan and if at all there is any subtle evidence of even bit of calcification you should do a ct scan complete the evaluation and then only go ahead with hyphema drainage if at all it's really warranted or if there's a high suspicion of retinoblastoma you should possibly go ahead with management of retinoblastoma in situations where there is lens coloboma and retrodental membrane like this even if the lens is partially cataractous or cataractous you may not be able to see the rest of the uh, fundus you should do imaging because you may be missing a patient with medullary epithelioma and whenever a patient has zonular coloboma you should suspect medullary epithelioma and whenever a patient has vascularized retrolental membrane then the diagnosis of medullary epithelioma should be very seriously considered that's because the posterior lens capsule acts as a scaffold if this is the medullary epithelioma it kind of travels along the posterior lens capsule forms a layer of tumor which gets vascularized so vascularized retrolental membrane can look like a cataract this patient was from the table of a pediatric ophthalmologist he was just about to make a clear corneal incision he fixed the eye here with a forceps and then he noted that the zonules were missing in this claw cover and then he found that there was a peripheral tumor right there so this was medullary epithelioma and the cataract that this patient had was secondary cataract due to tumor proliferation along the posterior capsule so this was a posterior subcapsular cataract sectoral cataract can also be a manifestation of medullary epithelioma you can see that this may look like you viitis to you but you can never miss this vascularized retrolental membrane in a patient with medullary epithelioma which is says i think people must have already covered lymphoma right right so if you have a patient who has chronic vitreitis or past planitis what may look like but behind that vitreous says if you find yellowish white patches in the choroid retina or if you find a diffuse haze beyond which you may see some yellowish white uh, hay, uh kind of uh, reflex from the retina or a cloud again with yellowish white reflex from the retina then you should or clumps of vitreous cells then you should think of primary intraocular lymphoma retinal and sub rp infiltrates look like this and this is a high association with primary cns lymphoma and that's why we need to recognize these patients these patients need to undergo a vitrectomy by diagnostic vitrectomy with a sample adequately processed and appropriately processed otherwise you miss, you'll miss the diagnosis of primary intraocular lymphoma they also need to undergo csf cytology and a contrast enhanced mri for meningeal lymphoma the association is very strong you can see that 40 to 90% of patients with primary intraocular lymphoma develop primary cns lymphoma in about 10 to 30 months so they need to be under constant follow up for this situation in retinal exudation we have three or four lesions if a patient has a macular exudation the lesion may not be right at the macula it may be somewhere else there are these are three situations that i am showing each of these patients have a different type of exudation this patient has an exudation with finger like projections pointing towards the fovea but you should actually look at the opposite direction direction in which to which this fact blood vessels are leading to and that's a retinal capillary hemangioblastoma so this patients can completely resolve of exudates you can see that once the retinal lesion is treated with cryotherapy exudation actually completely resolves 
one more example of remote macular exudation because of a retinal capillary hemangioblastoma that's a optic disc hemangioblastoma that can also cause exudation so exudation is a feature of retinal capillary hemangioblastoma one more lesion that can cause dramatic amount of exudation is vasoproliferative retinal tumor this is a peripheral retinal lesion it's like exuberant granulation something like pyogenic granuloma in the conjunctiva that develops in the retina because of some retinal insult which could even be photocoagulation pass planitis retinal cryotherapy etc one more uh, reason for macular exudation with refractile kind of appearance is coats disease you can see peripheral retinal telangiectasia with macular exudation which is quite refractile and that's coats disease now this is nothing but chirpy right chirpy can grow and sometimes chirpy which is absolutely supposed to be flat can get some thickness so chirpy can grow in terms of diameter and it can also grow in terms of thickness but as long as it does not have exudation you have nothing to worry the moment it starts developing exudation but without a feeder vessel then you categorize it as retinal retinal pigment epithelial adenoma but the moment it develops vessels like this then that is retinal pigment epithelial adenocarcinoma so chirpy can evolve into retinal pigment epithelial adenoma and adenocarcinoma although it is rare you should always remember that a retinal pigment epithelial lesion or a charcoal black lesion that is in the level of retina not choroid can actually be retinal pigment epithelial adenocarcinoma so these are the uh, mascarts that i touched upon scleral pigmentation sentinel vessel sectoral iris hum unilateral glaucoma in the young granulomatous uveitis hy hypopion hyphema lens coloboma and retrolental vascularized membrane vitritis and retinal exudates thank you